Hello, At Percussion listeners, and welcome to a special feature of the At Percussion podcast. Last month, we lost one of the greats in our field, Emil Richards. Emil was one of the most influential percussionists of all time. His illustrious career spans an astonishing seven decades, and it would be impossible to sum up all of his contributions. To hit a few of the highlights, though, Emil performed and recorded along the likes of Frank Sinatra, Harry Parch, Frank Zappa, George Harrison, Marvin Gaye, and hundreds more. His iconic work in the L.A. recording scene included many of the most famous movies and TV shows of all time. Iconic moments include the snaps on the Addams Family theme, the xylophone licks on the Simpsons theme, and the bongos on the Mission Impossible theme. Other work included Planet of the Apes, Jaws, Indiana Jones, Ghostbusters, Lethal Weapon, Jurassic Park, Toy Story, and literally thousands more. He was also a strong advocate for union work in the L.A. scene. I had the chance to meet Emil in 2009 during my studies at the University of North Texas, and he was the warmest, funniest person I've ever met. I'll never forget that right before the concert, I was hanging out with a friend whose then-girlfriend came to say good luck. She gave my friend a kiss, and Emil turned to her and said, Hey, where's mine? We took a photo right after that moment with my friend Taylor and me in our full Indonesian gamelan getup. Emil went on to absolutely obliterate some jazz standards on vibes with Ed Sof on drums. I particularly remember a burning straight no chaser. He also took a jazz chime solo and made some fantastic wisecracks on stage. And in 2017, I was so honored to get to speak with Emil for an hour as a podcast guest. Well into his 80s, he was as sharp and full of energy as ever. I last saw him in 2018, when his dear friend Joe Picaro was being inducted into the PAS Hall of Fame. I just watched from afar as this unsuspecting human wandered through the exhibit hall, quietly checking out what was new in the world of percussion that he had done so much to create. For more on Emil's work, I would highly recommend his book, Wonderful World of Percussion, My Life Behind Bars. He also appears on episode 82 of this podcast and is rightfully a member of the Percussive Arts Society Hall of Fame. I asked a few previous guests that were friends with Emil to share stories. Please enjoy the following tributes from Anders Estran, Puvlar Srigi, Fernando Meza, Julie Spencer, John Beck, Mark Ford, Bob McCormick, TJ Troy, and Jonathan Haas. here from Stockholm, Sweden, and um, I just will give you some uh, great memories of my dear, dear friend, Emil, who passed away too early. Um, I met Emil the first time in 99 at PASIC uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and um, I was doing, doing a clinic performance, and then suddenly in the front row I hear like, man, oh wow, you and I was showing some weird stuff and play probably play with some brushes on the vibes or something and he got excited I never met him before I asked so you know see his books and see pictures and all that stuff so um, after the session he jumped up on stage and said Anders where have you been and I said I'm here now and then from that point in 99 we always met at PASIC uh, tried to find a uh, 
every corner we could with some instruments, some vibes and marimbas and we always played. So we got invited, uh, for example, John Whitman, who is also a dear friend, thanks John, for everything you've been doing for for us and for Emil. And he always invited us to do some Yamaha evenings or breakfast, or whatever we could find. And then I visited Emil the first time in 2004, when I was out on a tour in LA. So I called him up and said, hey, I have two days free. And he picked me up, it took one hour, he was there. And I said, Anders, you stay in my house. So we, uh, I spent uh, with a lovely house with a, his lovely wife, Celeste, who is the best support you can think of. Uh, so they took me around. So I was up to his um, instrumental rentals place. And he said, Anders, I don't have so much instruments anymore. I said, how much do you have? So that time we had 2,500. I think that was quite a lot. So anyway, so we spent probably four hours in playing around on stone marimbas, glass marimbas, whatever you can find. So my picture of Emil is like the little 13-year-old guy, always curious about new sounds, everything you can think of in sound-wise. And if you find some new toys to play with, he was like, he was there immediately. Plus he was a great younger, older brother, mentor, everything you can think of. He was that kind of person that if you have some trouble in your band, you put them in the middle, it took probably five, 10 minutes, everything was, every problem was solved. Just the fact of having him in the room. So Emil, really miss you a lot. And thanks for all the fantastic music making you've been doing and all the inspiration. So um, I know it will be a lot of groove up there and a lot of new sounds so uh, take care and thanks to everybody who've been in support for Emil and Emil's music and thanks Celeste for being really supporting him all the best Anders Merry Christmas I have a long association with Emil since 1986 when he came to the United States we have a ocean the ocean takes up every kind of ships, boats, yachts. In the same way, Emil is a ocean. We will come across him. We found a space for them. I was lucky enough to be in that ocean, sailing in a smaller way. He's very giving for all the people he knows. He has friends from his age to younger age as 20 years, 25 years, because he always connected with the younger generations. He never hesitated to help them and give them wise advices, what they need. He was always smiling and he made music very happy. A couple of incidents my association with him I should share. The first time I played with him at UCLA Rice Hall with the violinist El Subramaniam. And once I came to Carol Arts, I knew he's a very good friend of one of my mentors, John Bergamo. Then I had this very special occasion where we went to this restaurant in Northridge, I guess, run by Frank Sinatra's chef. And that day it was a very special day because it was Remo, Emil, John Bergamo, Doc, all four of them were there in LA and I was able to just sit along with them and see them conversing and very frequently also in Italian. So I have a lot of good advices from him which I still follow and it is a great loss for the music community and uh, our heartfelt condolences on behalf of music community to Celeste 
and the cabin and this music will always be with us by Emma. Emil Richards. What can I say about Emil Richards? Or what can anybody really say about Emil Richards besides the fact that we all in the percussion world knew this incredible creative genius of sound? Because that's what he was. He was really an endless source of curiosity and creativity about sound. Um, we all know, of course, that, that he was the most sought after percussionist in Hollywood and that his output is just extraordinary when it comes to all the soundtracks for movies and, and TV shows and commercials and so on that he did. Um, and, you know, we of course know that he was also instrumental in many other things in terms of uh, contracts, for example, um, you know, in, in, in labor type negotiations uh, for the union, musicians union and establishing that and, and so on. So um, we really owe him a great deal. Uh, certainly us percussionist, uh, percussionists owe, owe him a great deal with regards to creativity about sound. I was very fortunate to, to have met Emil back in the probably late 80s or so at one of the international percussion conventions, the PASIC conventions. And um, ever since, every time I would see Emil at one of these uh, PAS conventions, we would always take time to just sit down and talk. Um, and sometimes there were short conversations, sometimes they would go on for quite a while. Um, and uh, it was such a privilege for me to be able to spend uh, that time with Emil. Um, he was just a remarkable individual, not just in, in terms of his music output and creativity, but just as a person. Emil was just an, an incredible human being. Uh, funny, really funny actually. Uh, humble, uh, witty, and um, we, we sh over the years, shared, shared about many things. Um, he knew that I was from Costa Rica. And uh, he loved Costa Rica. He had gone there a couple times before we had met even and uh, told me how much he loved the country and um, how he wanted to go back and so on. And during one of these times that we met, he saw me and, and, and told me about the fact that he had bought property in Costa Rica. And that was the subject of many jokes for us later, you know, kind of our, our inside jokes that we had about different things. Um, but he he loved the fact that in Costa Rica he he went one time in was at a restaurant and there was a marimba group playing like a traditional marimba ensemble playing and he was so excited about that and and that was just proof to me of his endless um, desire to understand culture through sound I think that was one thing that that Emil had in spades that he wanted to get to know people and places and cultures through music and through sound. And that, that was a fascination for him that, that never ended. And we, of course, all of us owe him a great deal for that because the sounds that he created for many of these uh, movie soundtracks that we all enjoy today are a result of that exploration and in, in, in thirst for understanding culture and, and instruments and sounds and timbre and so on. So I was just very fortunate that I was able to spend the time that I did with Emil and uh, he found it funny a, a lot of times that I would uh, be so blunt about some things. Uh, growing up in Costa Rica, for example, you know, the, the issue of money was never a taboo thing for me. So whenever I would talk to Emil about, about um, financial things in, in Hollywood, um, he always found it really funny. Uh, and somewhat irreverent, I guess, on, on my part that I that I could speak so freely about money. And and um, I remember one time I was asking him some, some kind of pretty direct questions about about money and, and, and the money that was to be made in Hollywood and and, and his uh, doing so and so on. And and he would laugh and he said, Fernando, you, you can't really ask me that. That's not OK. 
And I said, well, but I want to have an idea as to, you know, what the, what the scene is over there and what, what people do. And he said, well, I'll give you an idea. He said, do you remember the movie Jaws? And I said, yes, of course I remember the movie Jaws. And, and now, you know, bear in mind that this conversation probably was taking place in the maybe mid 90s or so. And um, Jaws, of course, was a movie that was done back in the early 70s, probably. And so he, he asked me, he said, do you, do you remember the movie Jaws? I said, yeah, I remember Jaws. He said, well, I still get royalties from that. <laughs> I just will never forget uh, his laugh. Um, and uh, he probably saw this shocked look on my face. And uh, I just will never forget uh, his laugh um, after that. And, and that became, of course, the, the, the topic of many, many other jokes for us down the road. Every time I would see him from there on um, at one of these conventions, I would always uh, wave at him. And, and, and because of his roots, I would always call him Emilio, not, not Emil, but Emilio. And uh, I'd say, Emilio. And then he would wave back. He'd say, Fernando, you know. But uh, I would always go, boom, 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 <laughs> whenever I would see him uh, because of the Jaws thing and the you know, reference to the soundtrack. Um, but um, what, an, what an unbelievable individual. Um, I, I would also, you know, whenever I would see him, I would also go like this too, you know. Uh, Emil was the, the finger snaps for the, um, for the monsters, or the, the, the Adams family, I'm sorry, the Adams family uh, theme. Uh, and um, anyway, he, he just did so many things. It's, it's hard to just say, oh, he did this, he did this, he did that. He did so many things. It's really an endless source of, of things. Uh, I remember at, at one time the, the, the website, Emil Richards' website, you, you basically could just hold the button to see all the movie soundtracks that he had participated in or, or commercials or, or TV shows or whatever. And, and you could just put your finger on, on the button and just hold it and the screen would just go and go and go and title after title after title after title. And it, it just incredible the output that, that he did. So he he did it all when it came to sound in in Hollywood, and, and we owe him a great deal for that. I was just very fortunate that I was able to spend the time that I did uh, with him, and that he would carve the time in his schedule uh, to just sit down with me and just uh, talk about whatever, not not about music necessarily, but about many things. Uh, I remember him telling me about writing this piece about Costa Rica or being inspired. By, by Costa Rica when he wrote this this piece, um, um, I forget the title of it. I think it was "What's the Pura Vida," um, if I remember correctly. Uh, "Pura Vida" is an expression that we use in Costa Rica to say that everything's good, everything's okay. But um, he uh, he was just a, a, a joyful individual, uh, someone that he found joy really in 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 the everyday. Um, things in life, and, and, and you could see that when you met him. Um, he was funny, and he, like I said earlier, he was so witty. Uh, he was very quick to come up with a, with a joke or a comeback uh, to a line that I might throw at him, and, and I just will never forget that. So I was just, just very blessed to have been able to spend the time that I did with him. So I know that he's up there making all kinds, all kinds of beautiful sounds. So, yeah. Amazing individual, Emil Richards. Thank you. Missing Emil Richards, Emilio, very much indeed. I'm feeling so very blessed and lucky to have had him be part of my life. My heart is aching, um, and my heart is aching for Celeste and Camille and all his family. He commissioned a lean for solo marimba using his rattle mallets and slap mallets produced by Vic Firth. Emil and Celeste gave Gernot and me a very generous wedding present 28 years ago and made us promise to use it for something wonderful and fun to celebrate the beginning of our marriage. I was thinking of Emil and Celeste's thoughtfulness just the other day on our anniversary. Emil invited me to the Film Studio Musicians Dinner Italian Night in the fall of 1988, where he asked me to give a performance at some of my music. He introduced me to Lalo Schifrin, Henry Mancini, Michel Colombier, and many drumming legends. Lalo invited me to arrange music for the Glendale Symphony and perform as a soloist. 
He coached Gernot and me at his home. Henry Mancini's wife asked me to play for an event after her husband passed away. And Michelle invited me to record uh, my first demo of my compositions at his home studio because he wanted to help me get going as a composer. The leader of the LA Jazz Orchestra invited me to open their concert at Royce Hall with some of my music and Leonard Feather wrote a short but beautiful review. All of these experiences were possible because of Emil. He invited me to the recording studio one morning and I played a climactic chime note with the trumpet section for one of Danny Elfman's first films. It was a joy listening to his combo play when he wheeled his vibes down the street to the restaurant to play with Joe Piccaro, his brother and best friend. And always such a trip hanging out in his studio at home, jammed wall to wall with art and instruments and history. He took me to his famous warehouse to choose instruments from my first recording, and we walked down aisle after aisle with stories from all corners of the planet and from all major films in the second half of the 20th century made with his collection. He was part big brother, part mentor, part soul friend, part legend, and I could never repay him for everything he did for me. And when we had words, and we did, because he wasn't one to shy away from saying what he really thought, he never said anything that didn't help me in some way. He had a heart of a child, the hands of a musical surgeon, the imagination of a sunset, always changing and becoming more beautiful in some way, and the faithfulness of a true friend, the smile of an impish wife, and a devilish sense of humor, memory like an elephant, although he didn't think he did, a sense of business only surpassed by his sense of time, and a deep sense of responsibility to help other people in every possible context. He was responsible for getting the union to change rules about separate payments for each doubling instrument and recording sessions. He was really happy about that. And he was thrilled with the beginning of a musician's names appearing in film credits. Emil has been a singularity in my life, in the world of percussion, and in all of our lives, for all of his life. He told me he did yoga every morning when he first got out of bed, and I think it was one of the reasons that he could maintain his professional schedule into his 80s, even after the arthritis started being a challenge. He was so proud of his heritage and of his children and of his students, and so humble talking about all his teachers and the influential people and musicians in his life. He was deeply spiritual, but unassuming in his idea of living a spiritual life. He loved to make people laugh with word play and puns, and he loved to discover anything different and new, with the wonder of a child's spirit, enthusiastic, and with endless energy to keep learning. The last project we were supposed to do was co-compose music for a documentary film with lots of percussion in the soundtrack. But when he found out that the producer wanted to contract non-union players, he explained that we couldn't do it anymore, graciously, but definitely, because he couldn't undercut union musicians, not ever. I respected him for the decision and of course followed his lead. Knowing Emil meant to follow his lead, and he always led things in the most amazing directions. Letting go is hard. God bless you, Emil, and all your dear family, and all of us in your musical family who miss you with respect and aching hearts. You always send your emails, sempre Emilio. Always Emil. You had the best laugh, the best smile. And you made people feel so special. And I miss you. Sempre Emilio. Emil Richards brought joy to his music. His enthusiasm for life and music made us all feel good. He will be missed, but never forgotten. I'm Mark Ford, coordinator of percussion at the University of North Texas, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my friend, Emil Richards. Uh, a few days ago, we lost an icon in the percussion world. This individual was not just a great musician, he was visionary. He was able to put together a wide variety of collection of instruments that uh, contributed to many films, many TV shows, thousands, if you will. If you would go to Emil Richards' <clears throat> webpage, there's a listing of all of the um, movies and TV shows that he's worked on, and it's incredible. It's amazing. How did he get this collection? 
Well, <clears throat> Amol told me that in around 1962, President John F. Kennedy uh, sent Frank Sinatra out on a goodwill tour of the, of the world. And for almost two years, they traveled the world on a state airplane where there was no uh, immigration, there was no um, uh, security to go through. So at every stop, Amol would select instruments from that com uh, country and put them in the uh, storage area of the plane and bring them back to the United States. Uh, again, absolutely uh, easy to do because there was no one to to have to check those goods uh, because it was a state plane. So this is how Emil started his collection. Pretty incredible and he ended up with three or four maybe more warehouses in the studio uh, recording area for all the films and so therefore many of the producers of the music would contact Amol to get new instruments and um, so that was one of the ways that he was able to create his career and also to diversify uh, his involvement with the mu movie production companies. One of my favorite stories with Amol, we were doing a, a festival, I think this one was actually in Nashville, Tennessee. It was a Tennessee day of percussion and he was talking to me about George Harrison. And uh, he was dear friends with George Harrison and his wife, Olivia, and uh, Emil's wife, Celeste, too. They were just great friends. And um, so they were talking a little bit about uh, one night in Los Angeles uh, when Emil and Celeste were getting ready to go to bed somewhere close to midnight. There was a knock at the door, and who was there but Ringo Starr, George Harrison, and Jim Keltner. And they wanted to get together and hang out. So... Of course, they welcomed them into the house, and somewhere around 9 a.m., they'd been up all night, Ringo said, oh, I have to go someplace. I have to go now. So they all ran to the car, and Emil said, I'll drive you. No worries. So they get in the car, and now they're kind of in the touristy area of, of uh, Hollywood where the tour buses go by, and they're driving, and of course, the car runs out of gas. So what do you do? Emil says, I'll drive, you guys get out and push. So now there's George Harrison, Ringo Starr, and Jim Keltner pushing the car with Emil driving. And while this is happening, the tour buses are going by, pointing out different stars' homes and things. And there's two of the Beatles pushing the car down the street. Pretty funny story. Anyway, there was also another great time with Emil that uh, we were in Sweden, in Stockholm. And we had a great festival, really amazing uh, festival that was organized by um, Anders Estrand. And uh, Jim Campbell was there and, uh, and many other artists. And one night we decided to go to a ice bar, which I didn't know anything about this. But basically, the temperature in the ice bar is about 20 degrees below zero. Everything in the bar is ice. The tables are ice. The, the glasses are ice. They only, sell, they only sell vodka there because vodka wouldn't freeze. And you had to put on these Eskimo type jackets and things to go in. And of course, you could only stay in for a certain amount of time. Of course, we wanted to do this. So we did this, went in and realized then that we had no camera. OK, so Emil says to me, he says, Mark, we need a camera. What are we going to do? And so I said, well, I'll go find a camera. So I walked over to uh, these gentlemen that were in the bar having a drink and I said hey listen uh, by chance um, my friends and I we don't have our camera and he said oh we start to talk and they were from I believe they were from the Ukraine or maybe Hungary anyway uh, Hungary is where it was and um, we we're talking and they said well, what about you guys who are you people and we said well, well we're all drummers and they said what he said, yeah, we're all drummers. We're here for a percussion festival. And they're like, you're kidding me. So they took these pictures and they, uh, we thought we would never see them. But they took a bunch of pictures of us in the bar and they sent them to me on an email. Anyway, it was a super fun night. We had a lot of fun and um, just one of those memories. Um, lastly, I, I mean, Emil was always an individual that would celebrate other people's work. He was so confident in what he, his contributions were. Um, to the art of percussion, to the movie production films. And um, one year, basically, I took him and Keiko Abe up to the PAS Museum when it was in Lawton, Oklahoma. And I'll never forget him walking through all of the instruments that he had donated to the PAS Museum and talking about in which movie he used which instrument. 
and it's incredible. So we need to get PAS to look through their archives because that's a really amazing uh, uh, exploration of what Amo was uh, doing uh, early on in the movie uh, film industry and how he was utilizing percussion sounds. Um, uh, really, there's um, so many opportunities for Emil to be able to to give to PAS and to give to people like you and me. Uh, his book, The World of Percussion, was an early uh, book for me. First, my first influence before I met Emil, I had his book, and this is back in the wow, around 1980 or so. And the book's in black and white. The pictures aren't so great by today's standards. But while for us, it was the first glimpse into world percussion and really some uh, definition of instruments and sounds they might be able to make. One day at a PAS, I was, um, this was before I was on the executive committee. I was on the board of directors and I'm sitting at the table as it used to be. It was a bunch of us, sometimes 30 to 45 people or so sitting around the table. And Emil came in a few minutes late. And then earlier that morning, uh, someone had played after Stuba. And uh, I had just written the piece. And for some reason, I didn't know that it was going on, that this group was playing it, but they did. And um, so anyway, I'm sitting at the table. I'm taking notes, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And Emil's walking around trying to find a table, a uh, place to sit, rather a chair, where to sit. And he comes up to me, wraps his arms around me, kisses me on the cheek, and then whispers in my ear, after stupa. That's all he said, he loved it. <laughs> and he made me laugh, I'll never forget that moment, you know. But anyway, um, wow, I could talk a long time about Emil, and really his contributions, his vision, uh, were exceptional, I mean, just amazing. So if you don't know much about Emil, please look him up. Go to his webpage, check it out. My deepest uh, sympathies to Celeste. Uh, she's an amazing woman. They were great partners. They always traveled together. There's so, so much love in this relationship. His daughter Camille, which I never had the pleasure to meet. Uh, my sympathies out to her and her family as well too. I have one final UNT story I want to share with you. Emil was here to do a clinic and of course share his experiences with our students and to perform a recital he was doing with playing with our jazz faculty with Ed Sof playing drum set. Well before the concert uh, Christopher Dean and myself took Emil and Celeste out to eat. We had a really nice dinner and at the end of the dinner we were just talking and talking and the Emil and Celeste started to argue about like what kind of dessert they wanted to have. And they were talking, is it going to be the chocolate? Is it going to be the pie? What's, the, what's it going to be? And so finally, the, the waiter comes over and says, so what's for dessert? And Emil says, I think we're going to have the chocolate. They've decided on the chocolate. And right then, I looked down at my watch and realized that it was about 13 minutes to 8 o'clock. And the concert was at 8. And I looked at Emil and said, we're not eating any chocolate tonight. He goes, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm going, to order, I'm going to eat that chocolate. And I said, no, we've got a concert. We'll come back. We'll get the chocolate. And I, we didn't even pay for the meal. I just told the guy I'll be back uh, with the restaurant and to pay for the meal. We all ran to the car and we get in the car. We drive to the university, which wasn't that far away, thank goodness. Walked into the building roughly about 8.02 or so, not, not too late. Uh, and we're walking, as we're walking upstairs to go to the recital hall, outside the recital hall is Ed Sof. And we were walking toward the hall. Ed looks up and goes, so where the hell have you been? And, uh, and Emil goes, he goes, well, we've just been eating. And he never broke stride, just walked right onto the stage, right in, took a bow, and they started the concert. <laughs> it was very funny. And then in the middle of the concert, I had brought up a set of chimes for him. This was, I don't know, somewhere around 2013 or so. And... Uh, it, why? Because every time he goes places, he loves to like take this uh, a ride on the chimes, you know, a chorus or so on one of the tunes. And he tore into these chimes and it was it was just fantastic. The crowd went crazy. So a real showman, a real uh, player from the heart and just such a, a great person. Uh, I'm going to miss him, miss him dearly. Hi, this is Bob McCormick at the University of South Florida in Tampa. And I first would like to express uh, my condolences to Emil Richard's family. He was certainly a wonderful and generous human being, and we will all miss him. 
I had the honor of working with Emil during the Harry Parts years. And Emil was always so helpful to us younger percussionists and, and so humble about all the things he was accomplishing. Probably in, in the history of percussion, there's never been anyone who has been as influential in the history of recorded music, especially in television and movie making uh, uh, and so on. And uh, he was also had so much leadership and offered so much leadership to both the Musicians' Union and the Percussive Arts Society. He truly left the world a better place, especially for us musicians. Thank you very much. So I wanted to share a couple of short stories about my interactions with Emil Richards. I first met Emil back in the 2000 aughts um, at a performance of my group, Parch Ensemble. We were playing down at the Red Cat Theater, and we knew that Emil had a long history with Harry Parch, having performed and was music director in Harry Parch's last ensemble, which was focused here in Los Angeles. And Emil was responsible for putting that group together. He put together a crack team of Los Angeles studio greats uh, to join him on Harry Parch's instruments, performing the world premiere of Harry's last major work called Delusion of the Fury. This was at Royce Hall at UCLA. And so Emil's history with Harry Parch goes way back. We invited him to come down to our concert. And um, it was really a lot of fun to see him even just walk into the lobby of the theater. He and his wife came down and just to see the two of them just decked out wonderfully for a night out on the town to see a concert of new music and see him come into the hall and as opinionated as ever, he listened to our concert and then he started to break each musician down and telling us what we did really well and telling us what we needed to do differently, which is awesome because he had direct contact with Harry and so knew what he was talking about a bit. Um, he helped inform me on some mallet selections uh, that had been made on the bass marimba and uh, really kind of gave me license to go out and discover some other possibilities of what to do on the bass marimba. And so it set me on this path towards investigating mallet selections um, uh, a little bit more personally. And I built several sets of mallets from that point out for use on the bass marimba. Now fast forward a few years to 2011, where Parch Ensemble again is getting ready to stage uh, another work of Harry Parch's, an obscure work called Ulysses at the Edge of the World. And like a lot of Harry Parch's compositions, it has several different versions depending on the year that Harry sat down to write. And this particular version we were playing, um, instead of the bamboo marimba, because Harry hadn't invented it when he first wrote this version of the piece, he wrote it instead for boob amps. And Amo Richards just happened to be the only dude in town who had several octaves worth of boobams such that we could rent them from him and be able to stage the work. So we did, and then we invited him to come down and join us as a guest artist on the piece, also at the Red Cat Theater, and that was a blast. That was a, just a golden experience, except it was kind of funny because we'd rehearse at my house for a lot of years, Parch Ensemble. We'd set up our instruments in... Uh, the middle of the loft space where I lived in Los Angeles. And that's where we would rehearse for about a month before our concert series would go on. And uh, Emil always insisted on parking in the driveway, which didn't really have a lot of room to accommodate a lot of vehicles, but it was very important to Emil that he bring his PT Cruiser as close to the bumper of my Scion as possible. And I believe that the back bumper of my car still has couple of love marks from where Emil tried to get into that driveway where maybe he should have rethought his strategy. No harm, no foul. Um, but it was really, really a neat experience to play with him and be able to share the stage and then just to talk shop and to hear the stories of all of his years in the Los Angeles studio scene and the numerous, numerous musicians that he interacted with. I mean, I don't have enough time in this video to go through the laundry list of people, but to hear those stories and to hear them straight from the horse's mouth was really a treat. The last time I spoke to Emil was about two months ago. So this would have been um, October, maybe it was September of this year. And um, 
a few years ago, again, working on Ulysses. Now we're moved up to another more recent version of the piece. Um, and instead of using boo bands, we're using the traditional mallet instruments, the parts ensembles, so bass marimba, diamond marimba, boo, bamboo marimba. And uh, that's the mallet trio of this particular piece. And again, I'm looking for mallet selections for the bass marimba. And one of my bandmates, Matt Cook, hipped me to these mallets. This is the Emil Richards core mallet or tone mallet as it was built by Mike Balter. And Matt had a pair of these and he said, try these out on bass marimba, they might work. Um, it's a short shaft. It's about a nine to 10 inch shaft. This is um, a very dense core that's mostly felt, but it actually has some uh, metal ballast built into it. And then it's covered by this nice Naga hide covering. And as you can hear, it actually really drives the fundamental tone of the mallet right to the forefront. It's a beautiful, beautiful mallet, and it just happened to work perfectly on the bass marimba. And I put a lot of miles in on this mallet. And earlier this year, uh, Parch just doing a concert, June of 2019, and I broke one of the mallets. They had blasted me for so many years, and finally the mallet head just flew off at the end of it, and uh, I needed a new pair of these. And I scoured the country. I called every single percussion vendor that you could possibly think of, whether it was uh, a store or a mail order only. I called every place that I could possibly think of. None of them had any stock of these mallets left. It had been discontinued a few years ago. I finally ended up calling Mike Balter directly and talking to him and asking, what can I do? Do you have any of these mallets? No mallets to be had anywhere. So I picked up the phone and I called Emil. And I talked to him maybe four or five minutes or something like that. And uh, he remembered me. And I told him what I had been using these mallets for. And he was super stoked on it. And he said, have you called Pro Drum Shop yet? Have you talked to Stan at Pro Drum? Well, actually, Stan was the first person that I talked to as I was trying to hunt down these mallets. And uh, Stan didn't have any either. And that was my first guess. It was my best guess. It was Anal's first and best guess. And unfortunately, there's no more of these left. And uh, I hung up the phone with Emil that day, not really realizing it was going to be the last time I was going to talk to him. Um, but I was still impressed with him in that conversation. Uh, his voice sounded a little bit worse for the wear. But his mind was sharp. And all of the knowledge that he shared with me that day, uh, he was right on top of it. He knew exactly who to talk to, exactly where to call. Unfortunately, there just wasn't any of these left. And um, he seemed excited. He wanted to hear Parch Ensemble's new record. He wanted to hear the core mallets in practice on that record. Unfortunately, I was never able to get him that record on time. And uh, um, I'm always grateful to Emil for the time that he was able to spend with our group and to help us in our journey towards perfecting this music. It's a journey, as they all are. And um, and Emil is on to the next step of his journey as well. And uh, we'll miss him, and we'll think about him often. Uh, but nice to have a personal connection to the man and his art form. Very sad day for all of us, the passing of Emil Richards one of the great and most iconic percussionists of the 20th century. We all saw him old Richards at the PAS conventions every year with his dark tan, smiling face, and incredible enthusiasm for students, and for education, for learning, for the percussion experience that we've all had. And of course, his incredible catalog of movies, jazz vibraphonist extraordinaire, and everything that really makes the percussion world a world of great humanity, humility, fun, and most importantly, a artistic life to be led in an example in Emil Richards. We will miss him greatly. This is Jonathan Haas in New York City, sharing my thoughts and uh, reminiscences about this great man.